All Eyes on AI, Updates in Privacy and Employment Laws. I am pleased to welcome my colleagues, Carmel Alipio and Mike Lord. Carmel is an associate in our IP section based out of our Raleigh office. She advises clients on data privacy and protection matters, including data breach notifications and compliance with state and federal privacy laws. Carmel also assists businesses navigating compliance with advertising laws. Mike is a partner in our Labor, Employment, and Immigration section, also based out of our Raleigh office. Mike provides solutions to workforce problems for employers of all sizes. He serves as a trusted resource for his clients as they confront the daily variety of labor challenges spanning the entire life cycle of the employment relationship from recruitment to separation. Carmel and Mike, I'll turn it to you to kick us off. Thank you, Lauren. So uh, if we go to the next slide, please. Today, I am going to focus mostly on generative AI and machine learning technologies that rely on data in the building process and use data via various models and techniques to generate new data or content that resembles human created data. This includes tools that you've likely seen or already used yourself uh, ChatGPT, Dolly, um, GitHub's, Copilot, Google's Bard, and others. The technology that can produce various types of content, such as text, imagery, graphics, and audio. Next slide. So before we begin with our look into the U.S. legal frameworks, I think it's time that we start off with a poll. This is the first question that you have to answer this morning to receive credit, as Lauren stated. You've worked on your company's or client's assessment of or integration of AI or machine learning technology in offered products and such for internal use. Remember, if you have requested CLE credit, you must respond to each poll to verify your attendance. And we'll have each poll up for about 60 seconds, so be sure to get your answer in. I have 20 seconds around that time left. Awesome, we have a, a mix of folks here today. So let's jump back in. At the federal level, the Federal Trade Commission, um, their authority to manage AI uh, matters arises out of Section 5A of the FTC Act which provides that unfair or deceptive acts or practices in or affecting commerce are declared lawful. So that section 5A is extremely broad. So AI technologies fall under that if they are being used deceptively or unfair. And the FTC has defined deceptive practices as practices that involve a material representation, omission, or practice that is likely to mislead a consumer acting reasonably in the circumstances. An actor practice is unfair if it causes or is likely to cause substantial injury to consumers that is not reasonably avoidable by them and not outweighed by countervailing benefits to consumers or to competition. Now, in addition to the administrative and judicial enforcement actions, uh, where there is often a public order detailing the result for businesses to learn from, the FTC often publishes reports, memoranda, and blog posts to help guide businesses. And there's a regular theme of transparency, clarity, fairness, and accountability in each of these. And the FTC has um, already issued authorities uh, applying to AI for each of these. For transparency, the FTC has stated that businesses should be transparent with how they're using automated tools. So AI technologies often operate in the background and may be removed from direct customer experiences. Sometimes, though, AI technologies are front and center. If you've vis uh, visited a business website, you may see the AI tool in the corner of the screen, that little chat bot there asking if you need any, any help. 
Um, and the FTC has warned businesses that they should be careful to not mislead consumers about the nature of those interactions. Now, transparency also includes providing notices to consumers about how, when, and for what purpose data is being collected. So secretly collecting audio, visual, and geolocation data for the purposes of training an AI product um, without disclosing that is a surefire way to end up in the FTC's crosshairs. As to clarity, the FTC has stated that disclaimers and disclosures should be clear and conspicuous. So that means consumers should be able to notice, uh, read or hear and understand the information. Additionally, if a business is denying a consumer something based on information produced by AI, the business should explain why, and they should be specific. It demonstrates that you know what data is being used in the AI model and how that data is being used to arrive at the decision. As for fairness, fairness means that your decisions as a business are fair to consumers. Um, so that includes not discriminating based on protected classes. But it also means making sure that businesses are focused not only on AI inputs, but also outcomes. So um, making sure that fairness is considered in each step of the design process, throughout self-testing, um, and continuously managing consumer protection risks. And finally, for accountability, the FTC has warned businesses that using big data analytics could result in bias or other harm to consumers. So to avoid that outcome, there should be a process for checking um, the product throughout the design and testing process. President Biden issued an executive order on the safe, secure, and trustworthy development and use of AI back in October of 2023. And that order echoes some of the FTC guidance I've mentioned so far and raises new standards for safety and security. I believe Mike is going to touch on this as well in the context of employment law, so I'm just going to limit um, our discussion about AI technologies as well as sharing information related to use and development. So the president also called on Congress um, in this executive order to pass bipartisan data privacy legislation to protect all Americans' privacy rights, as he recognized that con companies often use data to train AI systems. Next slide. So now let's pivot uh, to state laws and how state privacy laws are affecting AI. As you may know, there is no federal comprehensive data privacy law yet. States instead have taken on the burden and passed privacy laws, which in turn have impacted AI development and training. Now, Virginia was the second state to enact a comprehensive privacy legislation following California. And like other state laws that have since followed, the VCDPA provides consumers with rights as to their personal data. And relevant to our discussion today is that bolded right, that third right on that um, slide, the right to opt out of the processing of personal data for the purpose of profiling in furtherance of decisions that produce legal or similarly significant effects concerning the consumer. And what stands out in this opt out right are two terms, profiling and decisions that produce legal or similarly significant effects um, that concern the consumer. Profiling under the VCDPA includes any form of automated processing performed on personal data to evaluate, analyze, or predict personal aspects related to an identified or identifiable natural person's um, economic situation, health, personal preferences, interests, reliability, behavior, location, or movements. So that definition is very broad about what is significant in that consumer's life. As for decisions that produce a legal or similarly significant effect, that includes any decision made by the controller of the data that results in any provision or denial by that controller of financial and lending services, housing, insurance, education enrollment, criminal justice, employment opportunities, health care services, or access to basic necessities like food and water. And Indiana, Florida, Oregon, and Texas have all adopted the VCDPA's language. 
So this right is also significant because decisions about lending, housing, um, insurance underwriting, and employment are generally regulated by the Federal Fair Credit Reporting Act. And so in most cases, um, businesses will be exempt from compliance with the VCDPA. But this could create confusion for consumers and some issues or headaches for businesses that engage in these type of processing activities. So if you are engaging in profiling for these types of decisions, um, extra care will need to be taken to track and maintain the consumer personal data to ensure that if a um, opt-out request is received that you can comply with it among with other um, rights. Next slide. So now let's talk about Montana and Delaware. Um, I've highlighted these two states because they've adopted a narrower standard uh, from the one that uh, Virginia set forth. In these states, consumers have the right to opt out of the processing of person personal data for the purposes of profiling in furtherance of solely automated decisions that produce legal or similarly significant effects concerning this consumer. And under Montana's Consumer Data Privacy Act, profiling includes any form of automated processing performed on personal data to evaluate, analyze, or predict personal aspects related to an identified or identifiable individual's economic situation, health, personal preferences, interests, reliability, behavior, location, or movements. And in addition to these aspects, Delaware's law also includes demographic characteristics. Next slide. So California, uh, the CPRA amended the CCPA and added the definition of profiling, which wasn't included in the CCPA before and is defined as any form of automated processing of personal information, um, including to evaluate certain personal aspects relating to a natural person, very different from the identified or identifiable um, definitions we've seen before, and in particular to analyze or predict aspects concerning that natural person's performance at work, economic situation, health, personal preferences, interests, reliability, behavior, location, or movements. So the CCPA designates the right to issue um, regulations concerning AI governing access and opt-out rights to the CPPA, which is California's Privacy Protection Agency. And I'll note that despite not having an explicit opt-out right related to profiling, the CCPA's inclusion of consumer rights, such as the right to know, um, the right to access, the right to um, delete personal data or collect personal data, is still significant in training AI products because businesses still need to be on alert for consumer requests and be able to readily explain the use of any algorithm or AI technology for which the consumer's personal data was collected. So turning to the CPPA, um, re they recently proposed automated decision-making technology regulations. And these regulations could be significant because they expand a business's regulatory obligations and could impact decisions um, that are most significant to consumers' lives. So for example, if businesses are uh, making automated, using technology to make automated decisions about consumers' employment, compensation, um, profiling, employees, uh, contractors, students, or consumers in publicly accessible places uh, to use facial technology, for example, um, even consumer profiling for behavioral advertising, um, that would fall under this new regulation that's been proposed. And the CPPA also proposed additional consumer protection around the use of their personal information to train the AI technologies. Uh, there are three rights. The first would be that businesses would need to provide a pre-use notice to inform the consumer about how the business intends to use AI so that the consumer can decide whether to opt out to proceed or to access more information. Second, consumers would have the ability to opt out of the business's use of um, 
automated decision making technologies, except in cir certain circumstances, like to protect life or safety. And third, consumers would have the ability to access more information about how the business used um, automated decision-making technology to make a decision about that consumer. Next slide. So now we're gonna shift gears and go back to the Federal Trade Commission um, and look at some enforcement actions that they have um, done. And, some of you may remember me discussing the FTC Kochava case during the last privacy update. I'm here to bring it back because more things have happened. The, to, so to catch everyone up, the FTC's complaint against Kochava included allegations that their practices of selling data involved engaging in unfair acts or practices prohibited under Section 5A of the FTC Act. Specifically, Kochava links mobile device location coordinates to mobile advertising IDs, or MAIDs for short, so that Kochava's customers could identify specific device users to certain sensitive locations, for example, an abortion clinic. So Kochava succeeded on its first motion to dismiss the FTC's complaint, and the court had held that the complaint lacked uh, sufficient allegations to show that Kochava's data sales caused or were likely to cause substantial injury to consumers as required under the FTC Act. So the FTC did have an opportunity to file an amended complaint, which they did, and Kochava moved to dismiss that amended complaint. And since my drafting of this slide, the court actually issued an order denying Kochava's uh, motion to dismiss last week. Um, so the amended complaint survived dismissal because it included allegations that Kochava's sales of a significant amount of data that it combined from, excuse me, that it obtained from millions of mobile devices around the world involved uh, a ton of categories, geolocation data, names, addresses, phone numbers, emails, genders, ages, yearly income, marital status, education level, um, all of these really personal um, information categories. And the court found that the FTC's allegations that Kochava's practices of selling such data may violate Section 5A by depriving consumers of their privacy and exposing them to significant risks of secondary harms. Next slide. So the next um, action we'll look at is the FTC versus automators case. Uh, this is a case of defendants falsely uh, purporting that they had a product that would function and produce outcomes that the AI product just did not do. And so the FTC brought a judicial suit against automators and the individuals that served as officers and owners of automators. The FTC's complaint against automators was that they lured customers to invest $22 million in online stores and falsely claimed that they could provide services that would increase incomes and profits. And the FTC also alleged that automators claimed to use an artificial intelligence product to ensure success and profitability for consumers who agreed to invest with them. And they also offered to teach consumers how to successfully set up and manage e-stores themselves using a proven system and the powers of AI. But in reality, uh, Automata's customers did not earn the advertised income and lost their entire investment. Um, the online stores that Automata set up for its clients on platforms like Amazon and Walmart ended up getting suspended and terminated for policy violations. And those clients were left permanently banned from selling on those platforms. So as part of the stipulated preliminary injunction order, um, automators and the individual defendants were preliminarily restrained and enjoined from misrepresenting to consumers and assisting others in misrepresenting uh, that their products would allow consumers to earn a specific level or range of sales um, 
specific numbers of gross or net income or profits, revenues, financial gains with no or little return on the investment on their far part, and that they would um, they would be enjoined from misrepresenting their use of using AI or machine learning to maximize revenues. So the stipulated PO at its core shut automators down. Um, and automators appears to be going through receiver hearings. And at the end of last month, the FTC filed a proposed stipulated order for a permanent injunction, monetary judgment, and other relief. So I'm sure we'll see um, more from that. Next slide. So the In Re Ever Album Inc. Um, action. We're going to go a little bit back in time for this one. This matter sell settled around 2021. Um, it involved Ever Albums photo and cloud-based storage app Ever. And the Ever app used facial recognition technology to group users' photos by the faces of the people who appeared in them and allowed users to tag them by name. Ever Album enabled facial recognition by default for all mobile app users when it launched its friends feature. Now, the problem with this practice was that Ever Album misrepresented that users could turn that facial recognition feature off. And instead, the Ever App combined millions of facial images that they obtained from publicly available data sets to create um, additional data sets for them to use in the development of their facial recognition technology. And the other issue was that Ever Album profited off of the use and development of that facial recognition technology resulting from the data sets that they uh, sold to their enterprise customers. Um, but it didn't matter, however, that the company did not share images from their users' photos, photos or their videos or personal information with their enterprise customers. The issue was that they had misrepresented the actual rights that consumers had with regard to their um, photos and videos. Next slide. So, um, this isn't technically an FTC enforcement action, but I've included it here. Uh, it was a, it's a statement that the FTC issued last month. Um, as I mentioned, the FTC is constantly issuing guidance to businesses. And in this guidance, they called companies um, using AI to uphold their privacy and confidentiality commitments, specifically calling out model as a service companies. So an example would be a company that trains a large language model and sells access to that model to a business um, who would then apply it to customer service chatbots. Uh, because the model as a service companies rely on data to develop new or customer specific models or to update and refine existing ones, there's a business incentive to constantly collect and retain consumer data. And the FTC notes that an increased amount of data means having to balance the business's obligations um, with consumer requests and security of the data, and as well as look for the potential risk for undermining people's privacy. And further, even if there is a discovery of how the data could be better used or integrated in another model, um, companies must continue to abide by their commitments to customers, regardless of how or where that commitment was made. So the commitment could have been made in like a privacy policy in terms of service, um, or even through promotional materials or a user registration process, if that applies. Um, so the FTC also included a reminder that any failure to disclose is as significant as any misrepresentation or misuse of a customer's data. So again, uh, transparency, clarity, fairness, and accountability all come into play. Next slide. So before we jump into data minimization, I think it's time for another poll. There is currently no federal comprehensive law on artificial intelligence or machine learning, true or false. Mm -hmm. 
We have 30 seconds left. I think the poll is complete. I didn't get to see the results this time, but I'm sure everyone got it right. Uh, we'll jump back into data minimization. It sounds like an obvious practice, but organizations using AI will likely face difficulties with actually complying with it. And that's really because training and using AI tends to involve collecting and analyzing as much data as possible. So in many cases, all the data points in a particular data set. Analytics involving large amounts of data may also lead to outputs that provide different or unexpected correlations that don't fit with the original profiling or processing for the original reason that the consumer request was obtained. Next slide. So these are some of the issues um, with teaching AI um, for bias and discrimination. You know, machine learning algorithms may incorporate the biases of their human creators. Where machine learning predicts behavioral outcomes, reliance on historical criteria can also reinforce past biases. Incomplete data, data anomalies, and errors in algorithms may also lead to biased outcomes. So for example, an algorithm using data from one part of the world may not function as effectively in other places. As for the conflict between AI needs, which is you know, the business needs and consumer rights, um, unexpected correlations, monitoring, overestimating, and dependency on outputs, we've touched on these briefly. Um, the fact that AI requires a lot of information for training and development. Separately, if outputs don't look like what the business predicted or wanted, it could be said that there is an issue with the data set. But the converse is also true. Going back to bias, if the outputs are exactly what the business was looking for, that confirmation bias, that business may be less likely to continually check and make sure that there aren't any issues with inputs. Security risks and misuse um, is another risk where the general security risk to data as well as misuse by internal or external actors. So if security measures are insufficient, businesses will not only have to worry about a potential data breach, but will have to deal with the consequences from consumers, states, and regulatory agencies. Next slide. So organizations using AI should consider um, establishing in advance the scope of information that will be necessary and relevant to developing a successful algorithm. So establishing guardrails for the technology um, should be part of the design and testing process. Uh, organizations should also adopt good information governance standards to enforce and appropriate retention schedules for the data used in AI. And you wanna keep the, the data set fresh and you don't wanna be relying on old data. Organizations using AI should also understand where the algorithm um, falls short um, and refrain from asking questions where the answers may be affected by that bias. So developing algorithms using unbiased data generated through a controlled process um, should be uh, key. Another uh, way to reduce risk is to ensure that the data set is accurate and representative of the population to which the organization will apply the algorithms. Um, and integrating um, de-identification practices to the data set to the extent possible um, and limiting the amount and the information and the nature of the information used. So, uh, a lot of the definitions that we heard about profiling involved an identified or identifiable natural person. 
integrating anonymization, pseudonymization, or encryption techniques will help protect the affected individual's identity. And accountability all, finally includes considering what is the mechanism to hold yourself accountable and whether it makes sense to integrate an independent standard or exercise. And there are outside observers and entities that can independently test the AI or algorithm, and those have been um, increasingly available and should be considered. Next slide. So another way to reduce um, sensitive data risks um, could buy data, but be wary of who you buy data from. That's considering, um, you know, the scope and the reason of why you're looking for data in the first place. Uh, regulators haven't really issued clear guidance on how much information AI users must provide to consumers about their algorithms. In most cases, organizations can furnish individuals with sufficient information about the AI or the automated processing without disclosing any confidential information. And going back to the accountability principle we discussed in the context of the FTC, um, it includes testing the algorithms for um, accuracy on the predictions on the big data and assessing whether ethical or fairness concerns exist and how to mitigate them. Um, and I'll, I'll end on the importance of transparency. You know, businesses that are more transparent about um, how they're using AI on consumer personal information and the reasons why they're using it will allow the business to obtain a broader consent if needed. Um, they'll also be able to encounter less resistance to the use of personal information, and they'll just build more credibility um, with the consumer. So. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike, who will provide us with an update on employment laws' impact on AI practices. Thank you so much, Carmel. If we could switch to the next slide, please. So I'd like to begin with AI in employment, and it's here. It's the technology is readily available, and it's here to stay because most employers have embraced it. These tools are getting more sophisticated day by day. So for instance, I think everyone realizes by now that there are bots that can scour the internet to identify candidates and then to encourage them to apply for an open position. So that's kind of an active means of recruitment. There's also technology that screens candidates that otherwise come to you, whether they're meet the minimum qualifications for the posted job. But now we've moved to a next level, something called an AI interview. So back in the day, it used to be a situation where you would be worried as a candidate, are you going to impress the interviewer? Now you need to be concerned about whether you're impressing an algorithm. So there is a... Uh, the first kind of stage through otherwise minimally qualified candidates where you have a video interview. And here you're answering questions from an algorithm. And as you're doing a Q and A with an algorithm, there's also a video aspect to it. So there's other technology that takes the visual cues of the interview and whether that shows credibility does it show interest? Does it show whatever? All this information is being um, gathered, assessed, and it's all done by uh, non-humans. And that data is now then provided to you all for decision on, on the candidate. So we have gone to this next level. And just like most things, there is a arms race, if you will, for AI interviews. So I've gone through some of the information that uh, some of the technology that's available to employers. There's also prep tools that are available to employees. So there's a tool like AI Apply that uh, basically you can put next to your video screen. It can hear the question and it can populate an answer for you. Uh, so you could basically use like the president take a look at your, your screen, and uh, it'll help prompt you to, to give an answer. 
Um, and there's a another type of technology, MYA, which I, I say is my, I could mispronounce it. That's a, a chatbot that will work with you interactively on Qs and As. So it's just amazing uh, the technology today. Um, and it's just, again, going to be with us. We're going to be talking about how the government is going to be regulating that type of thing. Next slide, please. So given the use of AI in hiring, there's been a, not surprisingly, a reaction from government. And this slide is telling us about the reaction at the state level. And I've listed out on the slide uh, a couple of states and the city of New York, which has um, already jumped into the fray and started regulating AI in hiring. Illinois' action is no surprise. Everyone knows that they're a leader in this type of area. Maryland has jumped in, and then we see New York City. The interesting thing about this and the other slides that we're going to talk about is that there is no law that's going to prohibit AI in hiring. It's more about regulating some sort of excess to it. So there's no uh, statute that's going to come down and just outlaw outright. You cannot use this. It, it's more or less beware, use it, make sure it stays within these guardrails. So the takeaway on this type of regulation for AI and hiring is notice and consent that folks who are being interviewed need to know what they're getting into. And they can vote with their feet and not participate in the interview uh, if they don't like to do that. New York City goes one step further and requires employers to do a bias audit of their AI tools. So other states are considering similar litigation, so it's not going to be too very soon before we have a patchwork of uh, state and local laws on this issue. And frankly, it's not surprising to, to us in this field. It's a continuation of a trend in, say, truth and hiring regulation that we've seen. So there's been many states, many localities that have required notice, either in job postings or in offer letters about what job you're taking, what you will be paid. Will it be hourly, salary, piecemeal? What will be your work week? When will you be paid? How will you be paid? check, direct deposit, or some sort of payment card. So it's uh, something that, uh, again, I think is a natural progression in state regulation and also federal regulation. Next slide, please. So I, I think it's important, and Carmel touched on privacy. And from my seat in the employment section, it's one of these things is why am I involved in privacy laws when I'm in my silo of employment? Uh, the fact is that privacy law includes employee data. It's not exempt. So in order for us lawyers to give good advice, we have to understand that there are risks in privacy laws here that we have to navigate around. And uh, in the last bullet point, I put out that uh, this really isn't anything new because the Fair Credit Reporting Act, everyone is familiar with that, that you can't do a background check without following its procedural safeguards. And that is a privacy-based uh, regulation. So uh, this is just the, the next evolution in it. No surprise that California is a leader in this and uh, Employee data is specifically called out as something that is protected. And just like in the earlier slide where we talked about notice and consent, the 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 verbiage here are the the actions that are required is notice uh, of employee data collection, and the employee is given a chance to opt out. Otherwise, you can't use that data. Next slide, please. And so this, this privacy 
regulation isn't limited just to the state level. It's also been embraced by the uh, federal government in the form of the FTC. And Carmel has spoken about its enforcement actions uh, when it deals with more kind of holistic consumer data. But we have to understand that consumer data also includes employee data. And the FTC has made it very clear that they are engaged in trying to promote algorithmic fairness. And uh, where is that best seen? It's best seen in their enforcement action against Rite Aid. And not to pick on Rite Aid, uh, but they were facing a problem that many folks do, which is inventory shortage, shoplifting, criminal activity. So what did they do to try to combat that business uh, risk is they went out and got some facial recognition technology and they used it to kind of profile people who would be in their view or in the algorithm's view, uh, someone who would be more prone to shoplift and people would be banned from stores and so forth and so on. Uh, the, the FTC got involved. And again, it wasn't a situation where the government said, thou shall not use this technology, but it was more or less, again, notice, opportunity to avoid this type of thing, and other types of safeguards. But you can just imagine the, the hard conversation internally at Rite Aid with the procurement manager. It's, what were you thinking? And the, the probably honest response is, I was trying to do my job in ending inventory loss, and I had no idea that somehow it implicated some privacy um, regulations. So I think the takeaway here is that there are unintended consequences of using AI technology, and you have to be very broad and holistic in your view about this. It's, you know, what are the unintended consequences, and is this going to invite some kind of uh, regulation or enforcement action by a government authority? Next slide, please. So out of all this, it's no surprise that the federal government is coming to the table and speaking about regulating uh, the AI field because the tools are uh, all over the market um, and the promises are very alluring that these tools are gonna solve every employer's problem it's going to make things faster, cheaper. It's going to increase the bottom line. And of course, there is no downside uh, to uh, adopting the, the AI tools. Well, the folks who are subject to it, the, uh, the workers, uh, they certainly have the ear of their legislature. And you can see uh, just from the names of the proposed legislation where Congress stands. It stands firmly on the side of people who think they're being abused. Uh, just look at the titles uh, of the legislation. Stop spying bosses, exploitive workplace surveillance, no robot bosses act. Um, so you can clearly get the, the drift of the regulation is that uh, this type of behavior uh, seems to be a step too far. And there's, a, there's a, uh, certainly an appetite to try to make it a fair playing field. And just as an aside, uh, while we're starting to take up this legislation in Congress, we are behind uh, the rest of the world. The, the uh, other countries have already developed or are just about passed their legislation on regulating AI. Uh, so that those may be models for us as we move forward. Next slide, please. And I believe this may be time for a poll question or may maybe afterwards. So I'm here we go. Question. Using AI does not pose any discrimination risk under the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, or Title VII. True or false? While there is probably a more correct answer, there's no wrong answer. We just need to make sure that you get your credit. 
and you have 30 seconds to do so. Uh, I've been told that 98% of you all say false, and I would say that that's the best answer here, uh, because the EEOC uh, recently, in, in May of last year, has come down with actual guidance, which calls out to employers the risks of using AI when it, um, it involves the Americans with Disabilities Act and Title VII. And if we could go to the next slide, please. So this guidance goes on, and it's pretty thoughtful. It explains how it is that this technology can adversely impact folks who, who may be disabled. So you see in the first bullet point is that the employer doesn't provide a reasonable accommodation. So here's an example of that. If you have one of these uh, AI interviews and you do a knowledge test and the test requires you all to, or the applicant, to use a keyboard in order to answer these questions. What happens when someone who doesn't have the manual dexterity to whip across to a keyboard? Well, they're, they're out of luck uh, because the, the test is only going to look for someone hunting and pecking and uh, hitting the right answer on the keyboard, where you could get the answer verbally, and would you get the right answer verbally, and so you would overcome the disability of the applicant. So that's an example of the technology not making allowances for reasonable accommodation. In the next bullet point, the EEOC is concerned that the technology is going to unintentionally screen out folks who are other qual otherwise qualified. An example that the agency uses is if an applicant has a gap of employment. That's usually a red flag, as we all know. Well, there's nowhere in the AI interview for the applicant to say, that's true. I was out for a year. I, I battled cancer. And I'm happy to tell you that I succeeded. So uh, again, the technology just doesn't allow for that type of input. Uh, and so the person's screened out because there's going to be the flag that says gap of employment and that you just move on. The next bullet point talks about uh, inadvertently asking disability-related uh, questions during the interview. We all know that you can ask those questions after a conditional job offer has been made and accepted, but not beforehand. So what about these uh, kind of personality tests that ask the question, are you an optimist? How do you suppose an applicant with major depressive disorder is going to answer that question? And if the, if the question is answered honestly, would that answer screen her out from continued consideration for the job? Probably because the AI technology doesn't know anything differently. So this exercise just shows us, again, the limitations of the technology that maybe for most folks it works, but it doesn't work for everyone at all times. Next slide, please. And so this guidance that was limited to the ADA and, and Title VII, it, it, it gets recycled in, in other guidance from the EEOC. So this guidance from the EEOC talks about folks with visual disabilities, and it says accommodations must be made for them. Um, an example is that, you know, nowadays, uh, 
everybody's a gamer. And so in order for there to be a good interview, the AI interview uses kind of gaming technology. Well, that's going to be awfully difficult for someone who can't see the field, can't see the game. It's going to be difficult for someone who needs more time to maybe read the instructions. Uh, and the game may be fast-paced and they just can't keep up. And the machine doesn't know otherwise. And so the, the candidate's going to be flunked and, and not considered for employment. Next slide, please. So it isn't all kind of doom and gloom from the EEOC. They, they try to offer out uh, some hope. So what, what can you do? Uh, because we all understand that you're going to use these tools. And again, the EEOC is, is not trying to outlaw them. What would be a good best practice? Well, first of all, it's awareness. So I think everyone here is, is becoming aware that there are some unintended uh, limitations to this technology. So we're halfway there. So there's awareness. There is also an opportunity then to, to kind of go back to see your technology. Take, take the interview yourself. See what your, your take is on this. But one thing that there ought to be is some kind of notice. Now, Carmela talked about transparency. You're going to hear that from me again is notice to the applicant, this is how we do things. And there should be a, a, a banner that comes across. If you need some sort of accommodation, let us know. And so you, you not only uh, put that out there, you invite requests for accommodation. And then of course, you're gonna treat them seriously when you get them in. And then if, if the test uh, is say a time test, you're gonna have to make allowances for people who need some extra time. It's no different than what you've probably heard from your children at school. Some folks are allowed instead of the 60 hour, 60 minute block, 90 minutes in order to, to answer all the test questions. Here in the employment situation, we just try to normalize the results so it's fair. So it's apples to apples for the applicant's performance. Next slide, please. So the EEOC is just not a paper tiger. It's out there and, and enforcing the laws. And this is just one settlement uh, that I want to bring to your attention. Um, this is completely different than the Rite Aid situation because here you have people who uh, are using the technology and gaming the system and making sure uh, that females age 55 or older are kicked out and males are kicked out at age 60. Can't tell you why. Uh, males get the extra five years, but there you go. So this was an intentional uh, computer program or software issue uh, that was meant to find candidates of choice and, and, and an easy case for the EEOC to enforce. And uh, of course, out of that, um, they issue these types of press releases. So um, once again, let's let's not try to leverage technology to break the law. I think it's an easy lesson to learn here. Next slide. So we've spoken about uh, federal regulation, state regulation, city regulation, but there's also those private attorney generals out there, the plaintiff's bar. And so uh, one novel case has been brought against Workday, which is a recruitment vendor that maybe you all use or use one of their competitors. And so this is a broad brush attack on Workday's uh, algorithms or its, or its secret sauce to, to recruit and select uh, candidates. And they said there's a disparate impact on African-American candidates, older candidates, and disabled candidates. There has been a motion to dismiss uh, that has just recently been decided. Uh, the court granted the motion to dismiss uh, because the allegations of the complaint weren't strong enough on whether Workday was a employment agency. But the judge was kind enough to point out what the errors were and give the plaintiff an opportunity to amend the complaint to address those deficiencies. So this case, I, I assume, is going to continue on and we'll just look out for it. Next slide, please. 
the NLRB is involved and uh, they don't want to be uh, left out of the party. And as you can see from this slide, the concern here is the dual use of technology. So technology that is surveillance, so wearable devices, uh, tracking devices, all this kind of surveillance information does have a proper business purpose, which is to increase productivity. But it also can be used for a sinister thing, an illegal thing, which is surveillance of your workers to find out if they're plotting um, against you in order to raise their wages, improving their working conditions, whatever the case may be. So this data may uh, be able to be sucked up and how, how does it get segregated and then how is it used? So the NLRB, is, uh, the, uh, the uh, general counsel has made it very clear uh, that the agency is gonna be looking at that. And um, certainly it is a clear warning to us uh, in the workplace is to make sure that we use the data that's collected for the proper purpose. Next slide, please. The OFCCP is in the mix, and frankly, it is the, probably the most active because it has the power through the, the government contracts to impose its will on the folks who are government contractors. It's one of the strings attached to the federal money is to abide by the, the federal regulations. And now AI has been placed into the mix. The government wants to know what the policies, practices, and systems are that are being used by federal contractors to screen and hire its employees. So this is gonna be front and center. Next slide, please. As Carmel noted, there's been this executive order and the two bullet points are pretty straightforward. Nothing comes out of that executive order that imposes anything on employers. So there's, there's no mandate, but whatever relief that may have given you is taken away because the order ensures that the agencies are gonna act in a concerted and coordinated effort. So the government, the power of the government is going to be harnessed to make sure that these issues are addressed. And you can see the agencies uh, listed below. So the Consumer Financial uh, Protection Agency, DOJ, EEOC, FTC, they are all going to be in the canoe and pulling in one direction on this. Next slide, please. So what, what are the remits here? Uh, we, we have a report coming about the labor market effects of AI. That report will most definitely be used to support additional legislation. The facts out of that will be used as the uh, reason for that legislation. And then what else is there? We have the Secretary of Labor who, who is tasked with helping people who are displaced by AI in the workplace, and also coming up with some best practices uh, to make sure life is good for employees who are impacted by AI. And then finally, some guidance to the employers on how to use this technology. That is what is going to be very important to look forward to. Next slide. The DOJ has a task, which is to make sure uh, that there's going to be an enforcement arm here, and they're going to go after these new forms of discrimination, algorithmic and AI-related discrimination. The DOL, not surprisingly, is going to publish guidance for federal contractors on making sure that they don't use AI to discriminate in hiring. So you saw that with the OFCCP in gathering information, and now there's going to be some sort of guidance or standard against which uh, that kind of conduct is going to be graded. Next slide, please. So we know it's coming, and so I thought it would be helpful in my final my minute here is to get out my crystal ball and kind of predict where we're headed. 
these are basically best practices. So at the end of the day, we're going to have to inventory our AI tools to find out what we have, what we're using. We just need a baseline. That just makes sense. Then the next question is, how are we using these tools? Are they using the right way? And more specifically, are they biased? And so right now we're left with vendors promise, promising us the moon and ending up that, you know, literally us using that product may be a ticket into an enforcement action by a government or agency or litigation. So from our standpoint, we need to manage or allocate that risk. The problem is there's no consensus bias standard out there. So when the vendor says, I am compliant, or I have made sure that this it doesn't violate any law, you got to take that with a huge grain of salt because there is no standard against which bias uh, is measured at this point. Now, the executive order is going to make sure that that standard is developed. But in the meantime, we're left with making sure that we protect ourselves in our contracts with AI vendors, with reps and warranties about compliance with the law, indemnity provisions, maybe some insurance limitation of damages. But again, at the end of the day, if the vendor's a fly-by-night operation, we may be ended up holding the bag. But these are things to be concerned about. Next slide. Once again, you've heard it too many times, uh, transparency. So I, I think uh, certainly it's going to be my recommendation that we give notice to our folks, give notice to applicants what we're doing with AI. Uh, educate them and train them about that. I don't think hiding the ball is in the long run is the is the best course that I think eventually that the regulations are going to mandate this anyway. So let's just get ahead of the curve. Certainly in the next bullet point, we have to be tenders uh, to the AI. We just can't turn it on and let it go. Uh, we have to watch it, cultivate it, uh, take care of it. And then uh, as experience tells us, pivot, make corrections. Uh, if the results that we see appear off to us, those suspicions are probably right. And we just need to put a pin in the use of the AI, AI technology until we get comfort that it is producing uh, the right results and not being uh, discriminatory in them. And I believe that's going to end our program. I'm sure someone would, I think Lauren will tell us if there are any questions, but I appreciate your time.